This is the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Podcast, episode number 11. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. We'll help you on your fly fishing journey with classic stories covering steelhead fishing, fly tying, and much more. How's it going, everyone? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. In today's episode, I interview Tom Larimer, the National Sales Manager for G. Loomis. Tom goes deep on the process to catch summer steelhead during the daytime, covers a new 11-foot, 11-inch two-handed rod, uh, gets into some of his ultra-flashy patterns, and talks about the rage on spay lines. Lots of big-time content in this one, including some hilarious fishing stories and some links to a number of great resources that will help you get into more fish. So, without further ado, here's Tom Larimer. You ready to get going on this one? I am. It's great to be here, Dave. Thanks. All right. Good Good deal. Good deal. So, um, yeah, I think today I usually jump in and, uh, you know, we're going to talk about steelhead fly fishing here. And I think today we're going to have definitely some good summer steelhead questions. That's uh, in our neck of the woods, at least kind of the Pacific Northwest. The Deschutes River is right in the back door. So I'd love to dig into a bunch of topics that, uh, you know, can hopefully help some people getting going out there. So um, how's that sound? You want to start with summer steelhead? Yeah, that's that sounds great. Okay, uh, so how about starting us off as far as uh, you know your history in fly fishing and steelhead fishing, how you got into it, and how you became. I mean, now you have you're a guide, you're a business owner, you've got kind of the the whole list, right? You're you're fishing all over the country. Maybe you can clarify how you yeah. got there. Yeah, um, well, it's it's a long long tail. I'll try to condense it as much as I can. I you know I grew up in the the Midwest. Uh, just outside of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and of course we have Great Lakes steelhead back there, and um, got into that at a at a very young age, uh, and you know uh, basically just kind of grew this passion, and I always knew that I wanted to be a guide when I was a, from about the age of 12 years old. So um, I basically, uh, you know, after graduating from high school and kind of dipping my toe into college. Um, started my own guide business at the, uh, the ripe old age of 22 back there. <laughs> wow. Um, but I also had the opportunity to spend some summers out in Oregon, uh, just kind of bumming around with a couple of buddies of mine. And, you know, when, in the Great Lakes, they don't really have a summer run component. So uh, it's more of a spring and fall run. And we had heard about uh, Oregon, you know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like summer steelhead, mountain biking, skiing, all that stuff. And as a, as, as a young young man with a lot of adventure uh thirst i guess we blazed out here and had some uh, a couple summers of just crazy stupid fun and living out of our cars and i I ended up uh, collecting cans to live for a while i couldn't get a job and basically just fell in love with uh you know the area of hood river oregon uh and all the surrounding fisheries the deschutes being included but uh you know at that time i ended up yeah i couldn't get a job out here so i ended up uh, kind of focusing on the midwest and uh, ended up guiding in michigan for uh, uh, four seasons i spent about a oh four 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 year tour up in alaska guiding up there and ultimately all roads kind of pointed me back to oregon so i moved hmm. back here in the early 2000s uh, i think it was 2002 is when i started to g- guide here and i got a job with uh, john hazel up mm-hmm. in the, the Maupin area of john and amy hazel and I had a great experience there. I got to work with Deck Hogan for a year and learned a ton uh, fishing with them and guiding for them. And then uh, started my own guide business uh, in the lower Deschutes, running jet boat trips exclusively. And that was in around, uh, I think, 2005, okay. somewhere in that zone. So, uh, yeah. And then uh, a couple of years ago, I decided to uh, hang up the guide hat and uh get a big boy job and so uh <laughs> now i'm the, the national sales manager for uh, for g loomis we're based out of woodland washington cool cool that's uh yeah that's quite a story what what made you that's always a good question i love talking to to guides because uh you know you hear people get into it and get out of it and for all sorts of different reasons what, what was the main thing that kept you from you know gu- guiding for for the whole for the you know your whole career yeah well you know i mean i think um you go through these different phases as a guide and, and admittedly i think when you first get into it there's a, a little bit of an ego driven uh you know element to it but um you know the thing that i i really think separates really really great fishing guides from 
all the rest is that, you know, there's a discovery process in fly fishing. And, uh, you know, all of us went through it when we, you know, got into it. And it's those kind of aha moments that you have in fishing that kind of take you from one plateau to the next. And so as a, as a guide, I took uh, a lot of pride and, and a lot of uh, just gratitude that I got to be a part of sort of that discovery process in, you know, helping people become a better angler, a better caster, um, you know, all the skill sets that it, that it really takes to be a good angler. And uh, I just, you know, I really, really enjoyed watching people go, especially people that I started from square one, kind of graduate up, you know, the sort of the ladder of techniques and become a, a really great angler. And, and I had a, one of the pieces of my business um, was also doing destination travel. So mm. it was really cool to, you know, kind of watch my anglers, my, my clients get better and better and then be able to go up to places like the Dean River in, in British Columbia with them or the Connect Talk in Alaska mm. or the Sandy in Alaska and, you know, all these. And we did some saltwater trips and, and, and uh, you know, it's just really, uh, it's great to have those experiences. And I was fortunate enough, as are most guides, if you do it long enough, you sort of develop a, a clientele that's really more like going fishing with friends than, yeah. you know, than work. So I had some awesome clients <laughs> that I'm still very close with and uh, just, you know, really enjoyed my time with them as people above and beyond, you know, the experience of actually fishing. Hmm. Cool. Yeah, no, that's a good way to clarify that. Um, yeah, maybe we could just, uh, jump right into some of the uh, questions I have here. And, uh, the first one being when you're talking about summer steelhead, I mentioned that in the intro there, how do you catch steelhead midday, um, on the Deschutes river? What, maybe, you can, <laughs> maybe you can run through your whole, uh, your whole process because, uh, I, I love, yeah. I love, uh, anybody that knows me knows that, um, you know, I'm coming from kind of a, a, an older school background where it's like, you know, fish morning, fish late, kick back, drink some beers, maybe trout fish, you know, enjoy, sure. enjoy the sunshine, but really never got serious about kind of that, that midday fishing. So I'd love to hear you explain, you know, how you do it and how you get into fish. Yeah, absolutely, and and this is kind of a big can of worms. It, it might get a little technical for, cool. uh, for those those that are kind of new to it, but I'll try to try to keep it as simple as possible. And you know, just a, a quick backstory for for those that are kind of new to steelhead fishing. Um, you know, there was many many years, especially on uh, the Deschutes River, um, that people just believed you couldn't catch fish during the middle of the day. Yeah, you know, it's, it's a unique river because it runs from the south to the north. And it empties into the Columbia, obviously. And because of that, the fish are looking directly into the sun throughout most of the day. And so uh, traditional dry line techniques work exceptionally well in the low light time period. So we're fishing either a, a wet fly or a skater. Um, and, you know, it, the you kind of focus with those techniques at the, the low light periods. And, and once the sun starts to come up, you know, there's a, a small window there where you might be able to you know, get the sun behind the fish so the fish are looking away from it that you can catch them on dry lines. But in general, uh, from that, let's say, 9 o'clock to, you know, maybe 5 o'clock when the, the shade is off the water, um, it was very much thought that you couldn't catch fish in the middle of the day. Mm -hmm. And so it was a, a kind of an interesting process. Um, after, I, uh, after I guided for the Hazels up in Maupin, I ended up guiding for a guy named Al Bagley up on the uh, oh, yeah. Indian Reservation for a couple months. Yeah, and uh, and Al was, uh, you know, it was interesting working for Al because, you know, he was kind of on his own little island up there. Yeah. He, he wasn't really influenced by what everybody else was saying because he just didn't really have that kind of input. So he just kind of figured things out on his own. And it was funny, when I started guiding for him, I... Uh, I asked him, I said, Al, what time do you pick up your guys? And he said, like, 7 o'clock. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, I'm used to picking my, my, my clients up at, like, 4, rowing down in the dark, yep. getting, you know, into a spot. And uh, I said, well, what time do you drop them off in the afternoon? It's like 4 o'clock. And I'm going, well, when do you take a nap? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and, and he kind of looked at me really strange, and he goes, well, what do you mean, man? And I'm like, and, and we kind of started talking about it, and uh, I said, well, you know, how do you catch fish in the midday? And so we put a, a sink tip on and a big fly and <laughs> you, you go catch them. And, and, and I think sometimes in steelhead fishing, we're very nostalgic people and we love the history of our sport. We, you know, we love the roots of our sport, 
but sometimes uh, I think the history and the nostalgia somewhat limits us from imagination. And the cool thing with Al is nobody told me he couldn't catch a fish in the middle of the day. Nice. He just went out and used his intuition as an angler, and you know he caught him. Now I will say that the fish, the further they get up the, the river, and and you know keep in mind Al is fishing in the you know top 20 miles of the river below the dam, so he's roughly 80 miles above where you know I was fishing. Um, you know, on my own, they act a little different. They're very trouty up there. So they tend to eat, uh, very natural stuff, kind of blacks and browns and olive leech types, mm-hmm. you know, type stuff. And you have very unpressured fish because it's on the reservation where you have to be with a reservation guide to catch them. So a little bit different scenario, but it was interesting when I moved down to the lower river, um, there was a couple of big differences from that fishery whether it was Maupin or whether it was the Indian Reservation. And the first one was that, you know, we started fishing in, you know, early to mid-July down there. Well, early to mid-July, I mean, you have sunlight from 4.30, you know, quarter to 5 in the morning all the way till, you know, 9, 9.30 at night. So you have these incredibly long days. So being out there in 90, 100 degree heat for, you know, how many hours is that? (laughs) I mean, they were, it was just too long of a day. So, Um, I kind of went on this little personal jihad to try to figure out how to catch these fish um, consistently with light on the water with sun in their face. Mm -hmm. And what I realized quickly was the lessons that I learned fishing up river didn't really work very well in the lower river. I mean, I caught a few fish, but it certainly wasn't a, a consistent pattern and something that I could feel really good about, you know, taking guys out and saying, hey, we're going to fish from first light till four in the afternoon, put in a 10 hour day on the water and we're going to catch fish all day. So it wasn't consistent enough. So, um, you know, the first thing that I really discovered down there, and I think that this is a, a really good point is that sun angles are, a, are, are kind of the first thing that you really have to consider when you're targeting midday fish. And so, you know, if you think about the sun is typically coming up to the, you know, well, not, not typically, it's always coming up to the south. And at that point, most of the time, it's at it's still at an angle to the sun because it's kind of out to the east, right? Mm-hmm. So it's it's at an angle to the river at that point. And as it tr- tracks across the sky, it's going to eventually get straight above the river, and then it'll you know slide to the west. Um, and so if you can position yourself with the sun behind the you know behind the fish, so the river is obviously not a straight line. It bends and it turns, and there are some places where you can have the sun come up directly behind the fish that's the ideal scenario but as the sun crosses the sky you know obviously things change so what i figured out was that if i could get the fish to chase the fly anywhere but into the sun that was critical so if you are let's say you're fishing on river left which if you're looking down river um you know you're on the left side of the Mm -hmm. river At that point, you would want the sun kind of on the other side of the river, you know, kind of shining towards you. So the fish is actually turning at your fly, following it away from the sun. Right. And as long as the fish doesn't have to turn into the sun directly, at which point you would want to go to the other side of the river. So now he's turning, you know, away from the sun and and following it to the right bank. That was really key. Does that make sense, Dave? Yeah. Yeah. No, it does perfectly. Exactly. No, I'm just thinking and... I was just thinking about some of the times that, you know, I have caught some fish on sinking lines in the past in the daytime and things like that. And just, I'm trying to picture, you know, where, where those were, but, um, I think you're right on, I mean, the angles and just thinking too, with one bonus that I think you have with the jet sled being able to go (laughs) up and, you know, go up and down the river is huge because, you know, a lot of guys are going down a drift boat and, you know, you're, you're, you're at your camp and you got your water, but if that water is, you know, like some of these things, if the sun's right in the eyes, then, then you're pretty much, you know, a little bit yeah the, there's there's no doubt i mean the the jet boat became as important of a piece of my arsenal as my spay rod did just yep. to be able to move with the sun angle so so that was really a, a key piece to it and then i started really playing around um with with a lot of flash and you know what i was thinking about was you know up in uh, in the Maupin area and above you don't see a lot of conventional fishermen i mean you see the occasional guy here and there but in the lower river, there's, you know, a whole fleet of guides that are out there and they're throwing spinners, they're fishing, you know, plugs, they're, they're throwing spoons and pretty much everything that they do 
is they're fishing it deep, it wiggles a lot, <laughs> and it's got a lot of flash and a lot of vibration. And so I started to play with a lot of different flash colors. Um, and what was really interesting about this time frame was that the in the Great Lakes, a friend of mine was trying to figure some things out back there. And he was kind of starting to play with flash colors as well. Mm -hmm. And so uh, he and I, his name is Jay, he's Jay Niederstad. He doesn't guide back there any longer, but he really was one of the best guides uh, in the Great Lakes Theater. And he's kind of starting to play with all these different flash colors, and I'm playing with it. And I, I'll never forget the very first day that we went out with flash. Um, it was like, I mean, the first run we, we went into, we caught five hmm. on, with the sun right into their face. Hmm. And, it, it, I mean, it was like mind-altering. I was like, oh, my gosh, this is absolutely incredible. So it was interesting because that first year I kind of just stumbled onto a flash color that worked really well. It's called Grape. It's a, a flash boot color. And, I mean, I'm using a lot of flash on the fly. Yeah. A ton of flash on it. And, and typically these are like – a leech pattern. I, I fish a lot of tube flies, yeah. and uh, you know either a purple or a black leech. Usually, some kind of an egg sucking version with a pink or chartreuse head, and uh, just a wad of freaking uh, really? a flash on the back end of it. And so, like and, a, just your typical intruder or something like that. Yeah, yeah. And so, but what was interesting was that lasted really well until about mid September, and then it just stopped working the mm. first year which uh, it took me a couple of years to kind of figure out that the flash color really does kind of change through the season. And as a general rule of thumb, the earlier the fish are, so our kind of July and August fish, tend to like brighter flash colors. And as the season progresses and the, the days get shorter and the light gets lower, they tend to go more, more darker colors. Mm. So blacks, copper is really key in the late season, bronze. And it's, you can kind of see it shift. I mean, it's pretty amazing how it just like completely changes and it, you'll have a pattern that's working one day and then all of a sudden it's just, it's done. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's, if you talk to, if you talk to the plug guys, they'll tell you the exact same thing. The same plugs don't work day after day after day. They, yeah. They'll have patterns emerge. So the flash color became kind of a, a, a big piece of it. Um, but then I really started to play, I think the third thing was I really started to play around with, you know, how we fish the fly. And, you know, traditional steelhead fishing, when you're fishing a sink tip, especially like in the winter, you know, you're making a cast down and across, make a mend upstream, you kind of slow the fly down and you mm -hmm. swing it across. And so the fly is really oriented parallel to the current at that point. And, you know, when you think about it, when you're fishing in the midday sun, you need to create as big of a profile as you absolutely possibly can. I mean, if you hold your thumb up to the sun versus a basketball up to the sun, what are you going to see easier, right? Yeah. So we really start playing around with fishing the fly super, super broadside. And, and the other thing that I realized in this is obviously if the fly is oriented perpendicular to the current versus parallel, it's going to be swinging a lot faster. Hmm. Well, as an added benefit, Honestly, it, the difference in swinging it fast, especially in the early season, was like night and day. Like, I, there's, and this is kind of gets back to my comment about sort of how we almost hold our, ourselves back with nostalgia. Right. The, you would not believe how fast I swing my fly, hmm. especially when water temperatures are in that, you know, high mid 60s, right. to all the way down to like even low 60s. I mean, we are burning it. But the big thing is, we're trying to create as big of a profile as we possibly can to get that fish to see as that fly as well as they can with the sun right in their face. Mm. And so um, there was another kind of component to that, and and that was really getting the fish to sort of notice the fly. Um, and 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 this to actually kind of took me a while to sort of figure out. And, and it it I mean honestly, this probably took me ten years to really kind of realize what the deal was. You know, I would have clients show up, and I'm thinking these two specific clients that fish with me every year. One of them was a great caster. He would cast, you know, 100 feet out there. And the other guy was like, you know, he just didn't put as much effort into it. And he was a good, he was a good caster, but, you know, he's probably casting 60 feet. Right. Well, consistently, the guy casting 60 feet was out fishing the guy casting 100. <laughs> nice. Even though technically – He's a way, way better caster and, and arguably a better fisherman. I think he fished his fly cleaner and all that stuff. Hmm. But what I noticed was was that 
you know, if you think about making a cast out, you make your mend, the fly sort of dead drifts, at some point, the, the fly really becomes, it changes attitude. When it comes into tension, it makes a distinct change. And what I noticed was if I can make that fly make that distinct tension change Mm -hmm. in front of the fish on the seam, I think what happens is they see this thing fluttering, fluttering, fluttering. All of a sudden, it it, it creates this trigger because they see this, you know, change in the attitude and speed of the fly. So it sort of became, to me, sort of the keys of the kingdom with this uh, because you think about that fish is down there looking into the sun. And they see this thing out there, it's fluttering, it's flashy, and all of a sudden it changes directions right in front of their face. They're going to notice it and they're going to turn. And this is kind of getting back to my original point about making the fish notice the fly is like if I can get that fish to turn away from the sun, now he feels a lot more comfortable going after it, right? Mm -hmm. So casting distance is such a critical piece um, and I swear to God, it's really funny because, you know, anglers, we spend a lot of money on really, really expensive rods, fly lines, all that stuff. We go out on lessons and like, I mean, you know, we, we want to jack. Everybody wants to jack a ton of line, right? <laughs> and I'd always have clients come every year, you know, and they were, they've they been practicing, man. And they yep. strip up a bunch of line and they jack that thing 100 feet out there. I go, dude, that is awesome. You smoke that. <laughs> now reel in 50 feet because the fish is sitting right there. Yeah. <laughs> And, That's cool. I mean, I think the best day that I ever had on the Deschutes was with it was with four anglers, um, and uh, and it was kind of a specific situation because there was a lot of kings around, so the fish were kind of in tight little close buckets to the shore. But uh, we, we landed like I don't remember how we landed, but I think we hooked forty two in a morning wow. with four anglers. And the key to that morning, I said to the guys, "Look, if you're waiting over the top of your boots, you're too deep." And if you're shooting more than 10 feet of shooting line, so you're making maybe a 50-foot cast, uh, you're casting too far. And yeah. the fish were just, I mean, I, and the Deschutes is kind of in its own little world in that sense that I do think a lot of people overfish the runs. But yep. the, the, the lesson to be learned, the takeaway is, you know, if you can read water and you can go, okay, that's where I think the fish is, try to make your cast just far enough past it that you mend the fly it dead drifts and it's going to come tight in their world so they see that direction change and so that's a that's a big thing and then if i can get that fly to kind of track across in sort of a broadside profile um that's really key so there's one last element to all of this um we've talked about a lot of stuff but there was there was one thing and and really that it took me a couple years to figure this out um there were what i noticed was that there were certain runs that i did really really well out of in the midday i mean you know we're going in at 11 o'clock in the morning sun is right down on the fish's face and we're jacking three fish behind you know guys that had just fished it with dry lines Mm -hmm. that morning and maybe they got one maybe they didn't but uh we're having i mean phenomenal success in the midday but it there was these runs that like just didn't kick out fish and then runs that did and it took me forever to kind of figure this out and uh you know i was thinking about okay, what are the common denominators? Is it speed? Is it, you know, bounce? Is it structure? Is it seam? You know, what what is it about these runs that they fish and these runs that they don't? And actually, I was taking a leak one day and I was looking at these big alders and uh, I realized every single run that we did really well out of in the midday had a big line of alders. Hmm. And, and I think... The, the key to this is, you know, the, the fish are seeing a reflection of what's above them. And if you think about the, the Deschutes Canyon, most of it is sagebrush and cheatgrass. Yep. It's that really kind of bright yellow. And I think that, you know, the runs where you've got these alder lines that are, you know, 20, 30, 40 feet tall, when they turn and start to chase the fly down, they just feel a lot more comfortable chasing that fly into the contrast i call it the green screen Mm -hmm. and so they just feel a lot more comfortable versus the runs where you know they start following the fly and they're kind of looking into this bright reflection and they really just you know they i just don't think they feel as comfortable hunting the fly and to prove my point one of the one of the best runs that you know existed for a long long time during the midday 
we had a fire a number of years ago and all the alders burned down and the next year we couldn't catch it i couldn't catch a single fish no out kidding. of the midday but i would get them there in the evenings yeah the shade was on the way. so i do think that 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 is really helpful and if you if you think about rivers like the north umqua for example where you've got a, a, a canyon with a lot of right. you know hemlocks and spruce and you know th- those fish are definitely i think a little more comfortable mm. but our fish i do think that that's a, a key piece to it so <laughs> you know it's really about you know the fly that you fish having the right color of flash it's about the attitude of, of the fly and how you fish it it's about capturing that fish's attention with you know kind of the the time that that fly comes into in detention and it's about being at the right place at the right time with sun angles and finding those runs with those big alders so it's kind of a long answer yeah, but that's, that's really great. kind of where, where my head goes to when i'm i'm really fishing those midday fish yeah no that's great man that's like summer steelhead like uh whatever level man that's upper upper level stuff that's good <laughs> Well, that. you know, it's interesting, Dave, is I do, I do a lot of saltwater fishing as well. And, uh, y- you know, I've, I've actually had a lot of conversations with tarpon guides because tarpon is one of the things I'm completely addicted to. Mm-hmm. And, it's, and it's interesting because you have kind of a similar situation. I mean, you've got a fish that's sort of on a mission for migration, right? If you're fishing down in the Florida Keys, you're going to see, you know, hundreds and hundreds of tarpon going by you. And they are sort of in this program mode to get to where they need to go and steelhead are kind of the same way um they will feed from time to time but in general they're they're booking Hmm. and so it's kind of like you're trying to unlock that fish and you know with tarpon you get to see the whole thing unfold but i i sort of imagine that it's it's a very similar type of disruption of their sort of like i need to go here you've got to make that fish notice the fly you've got to get him to break out of that mindset of where he's going to yeah. to really the fish. So. It's pretty cool because I th- I'm just thinking back everything you talked about, and um, I guess I had just one clarification on. I guess it was kind of the, the number three part of it. I guess you were kind of talking about more leading the fly. Was is that yeah yeah just basically just leading the, yeah so typical which which makes yeah. total sense. I mean, I'll expand on that just a little bit. You know, I think about. You know, if you make your cast out, your you know your first decision that you have to make is your casting angle, and the further you cast downstream, kind of across the current, if you will, the slower that fly is going to swing. Mm-hmm. But it's almost impossible to get the fly into a broadside position. The more you know across the current you cast, or sort of ninety degrees to the bank you're on, obviously the fly is going to swing a lot faster. But it allows you to really kind of get that fly into more of a broadside position. Yep. So you, you know, once you've made your casting you know, once you've made your cast, your next decision is your mend. And is it a hard upstream mend? Is it a almost like a downstream pull? But whatever you do, we're trying to create slack so that that sink tip and the weight of the fly, I mean, typically I'm fishing a fly with some weight on it because I want it to get down. And, uh, you know, there's that slack period. So once I bring the fly into tension, I usually have my anglers kind of lift their rod and really, the attitude of the rod is what's going to set the belly. So, in other words, if I lift out over the water with my rod, I'm going to set the belly kind of into the current, and I'm naturally going to create a slower swing. If I lift downstream or kind of the inside, now I'm going to set it in a super broadside swing. So, mm. that kind of, I call it the point of contact. When you've made your mend, it's dead drifting, I'm now going to lift and get that tension on the fly and get it fishing. I'm really kind of setting the attitude of the entire swing. I'm trying to set it up to really, my, uh, I really think about swing speed based on water temperature. So I kind of, kind of mentioned that a little bit earlier. So the warmer the water, the more aggressive and broadside and fast I want it to be. And, you know, as the season progresses, we'll kind of go into more of a semi broadside swing, not quite as fast, right. still trying to create a profile. And by the time we're into, you know, November, a lot of times, you know, we're, we're fishing the fly a lot slower and not nearly as aggressive. So yeah. um, you've got to kind of change with the conditions. Yeah, no, that's cool. I, another cool thing, just thinking about this with the, the the big fly, just thinking about in the evenings, you know, a lot of times we're using the small, you know, the smaller the better almost, you know. Yeah. So some of these things are just, you know, tiny little little specks in the water and those fish are loving it. But it's... Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's in- I mean, they'll eat. I mean, I've had seasons where, I mean, we were fishing a, a size six egg hook with a little tiny wet fly yep. tied on it 
Exactly. And, I mean, it's they, they can. I've had them. I've watched them eat blood knots. Ugh. You know, when I'm up on on a high bank and I'm watching the fly swing and fish comes up and grabs the freaking blood knot. No on kidding. The you know, that's cool. You gotta be kidding me. <laughs> so they see a lot. <laughs> nice, nice. No, this is awesome, man. We're, well, I guess we're about halfway through the uh, the show here. Trying to try to keep it to around an hour, and I, I we might have to have you back on later to answer some of these <laughs> other questions if we can't get through it. But no, uh, that was a big question to lead with. It was. You know what? I always like to I like to throw out the biggest thing that's out there. I think that is, uh, and you did a good job clarifying that. So um, you mentioned uh, kind of off there when we talked about. I think it was the eleven foot eleven inch and the Skagit short. A new yeah. is that something you could talk about or? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, one of my first projects with G Loomis was um, helping to develop a, a series called the IMX Pro, and there's a whole single hand series that's kind of built around modern trout fishing techniques, and then there's a two handed series. And what we what we really wanted to do with, it, with this series was to kind of address the the modern era of shooting head style lines. And specifically lines like uh, the, the Skagit Scout, the Skagit Switch, and the Rage Compact, which are all airflow lines that I've actually developed with, uh, with Tim Rajeff and his mm. team at Rajeff Sports. Um, and so, you know, we, we really gave a lot of thought to, you know, kind of the, the overall length. You know, switch rods are, are, are fun and they're light, but they, they just... In most cases, I just am always asking myself for something a little bit longer. And, you know, there's certainly a place for a 13, 13 foot three rod, whatever, um, especially sink tip fishing that, that works well. But that 11, 11 length was kind of magical um, just because it's light like a switch rod in your hand, but it doesn't feel so like with switch rods, I just feel like you've got to be right on your timing you got to be pretty mm-hmm. aggressive you really have to kind of jam on them to make them really work mm-hmm. this has more of a true spay taper so it's got a fairly powerful tip section very positive and it has some nice flex through the mid so you don't feel like you're super rushed through it they're really easy really fun to cast but just kind of that perfect length that you've got enough control to you know fish those 60 70 80 foot casts yeah it's still light in your hand and you can just jam on it all day. Is it day. kind of a, um, so would you say it's kind of a, a medium or slower action type rod? It's, no, uh, I would put it in a, in kind of a medium fast. Medium, yeah. So medium when fast, I okay. The, the, the butt section and mid section are, you know, I, I wouldn't call them moderate, but, yeah. you know, it does have that kind of a true spay taper to it, not a not a switch taper that's really stiff through the mid and a little softer up high. So they're really fun, man. I mean, it, it, you jam on them and, yeah. Put, it, put put one of those Skagit Scouts or a, a Rage on them, and my gosh, man, it's just, uh, they're addictive. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah, I was just thinking, uh, had uh, S- uh, Simon Gosworth on in episode uh, uh, nine, and yeah. he, was, he was talking about, we were talking about more beginners, you know, and getting into it and, and just finding that first rod, and he made a good point that, you know, it's a good idea to find a rod that is similar. If you're a single-handed caster, find a rod that's similar action just getting started absolutely um you know because yeah, it makes and that makes total sense and it sounds like um and then once you get into it you start you're a little more advanced and you can start you, do you it sounds like this rod is a fairly would this be something that somebody you know new to spade casting would want to start with or yeah uh, absolutely i mean i i never recommend that beginners start with a switch rod and that's more about the the overall action of the rod um so this is a uh, you know it's the the holy grail of product design for me has always been to make something that is very accessible to a wide range of, of anglers, whether they're fairly new to the sport or intermediate, but it's also not, you know, so dumbed down that an advanced caster wouldn't really enjoy fishing it. So I think we kind of nailed it on this one. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I would certainly put it in the hands of uh, really of, uh, of just about any level uh, of caster out there. Nice. Nice, cool. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned uh, previously uh, some names of people that have uh, you've worked with, and sounds like influenced you over the years. Anybody else, as far as mentors, you you want to note here that we haven't talked about? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, man. I mean, there's so many uh, there's so many great people in our industry um, that are you know you kind of develop sort of a, a circle of friends, um, and and some of those people that I sort of consider in my my inner tribe are. Um, uh, you know, they're, they're people that aren't even in the industry. Um, I have a, a really close friend of mine named Jason Kirchie, who is, in my opinion, the best steelhead angler I've ever met. Hmm. And nobody knows who he is. Mm-hmm. Um, 
but he's just kind of one of those you know guys who critters around in the woods and puts his time in and puts his head down and and yeah. uh I, I would say, uh, you know, of anybody, Jason is one of those guys who's really kind of influenced my thinking. And it's, you know, and, and there's a handful of other uh, of others out there. But, you know, what I love about that is, you know, having, you know, having people like Jason, my, uh, I still do have some ownership in my, my guide business. Um, Todd Harris is a, a good friend of mine mm-hmm. who kind of bought my business. And, you know, he's one of those guys that's kind of in the tribe with me. And, um, you know, having those guys and just being able to bounce information off of it and whether it's flies or whether it's techniques, um, you know, it's, it's just really cool to have great anglers yeah. like that. Um, yeah, I would say that those two guys were, were huge. And I mean, there's a long list of, of other people. So, um, you know, I, yeah. in the great mix, I learned a ton from my mentor back there was Ray Schmidt. I worked mm-hmm. for him. Uh, and some, some of the guides that I, I worked with, Brian Pitzer and uh, Jay Niederstadt, uh, just, you know, awesome guys. So, mm-hmm. you know, I'm kind of fortunate. I'm one of the very few people who's gotten to spend time in both the Great Lakes Theater and the West Coast Theater mm-hmm. for Steelhead. So yep. uh, it's been kind of a cool road to, to learn from a lot of different people. Yeah, no, it is cool that you have both of those. I. I get questions from all around, you know, <laughs> all, wherever there's steelhead, I get questions that I've always tried to, where I don't have the answers, find good people. And I've got uh, Kevin Feenstra, who I was chatting with. He's, I guess, more of a Michigan guy. He's going to come on and yeah, yeah. chat, yeah, hear about some stuff. But uh, yeah, good. So um, uh, thinking more about uh, your career again, you, you talked a little bit about it. I, I guess thinking back to, I mean, you've done this since you were 22 years old, which is, <laughs> which is amazing. You know, I mean, that's, that's really cool. What do you think back like a, like a turning point or something that really, you know, cause I can imagine there's points where you're like, well, people give up and then some people stick with it. Did you ever have that sort of thing in your career or have you always been just, you know, full board, you know, no problems along the way. It was pretty, <laughs> pretty easy. Yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah, man. I mean, I think, uh, I think anybody who spends enough time rowing boats and jumping in and out of them and guiding, you know, there's, there's definitely those, um, those moments when you're like, what, what have I done? But, uh, you know, I think for me, probably one of the bigger moments was that, um, when I started my own business, I was, I was on my own for the first couple of years. And then I, I added, uh, a number of guides at one point I had like three or four guys working for me and, 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 uh, Honestly, I got to a point with it where I was uh, I was completely burnt out. Now, at that time, I had started steelheadbum.com hmm. uh, with uh, my good friend Travis Duddles from the Gorge Fly Shop. So not only was I you know, running a guide service and managing a guide service, I, I was still guiding four or five days a week, plus running this online store, plus doing private casting lessons, clinics all over the country, hmm. speaking engagements. And I just got to this point where I, I honestly just I hated it. I just didn't even want to think about it. And so towards kind of the end of my career, about the last four or five years there, I just sort of went back to just being myself and, and uh, you know, st- stopped having a bunch of employees and just focused on, on you know, just me. Yeah. And it was – for me, I think it was really cool because I think the last – really the last like four years of my guide career were the best. And, uh, and I was really close to just going, you know, is this really where I want to be? And the last four years were just awesome. You know, I, I think mm-hmm. I, I made some changes in my business. I went to exclusively camp trips on the Deschutes during the fall. And, and that really was a game changer. And, um, you know, just really enjoyed the, the end of it. And, you know, and truthfully, when I retired, I, you know, I mean, I, I was not like burnt out on it. Um, I knew I was kind of looking for something something different down the road but um you know the opportunity with g loomis came and uh, and it was the right fit for me but you know I, I wasn't one of those guides who you know at the end was just so burnt right. out that i just didn't even want to be on the water anymore so yeah i guess if there was a turning point um it was just it was kind of that that yeah. kind of defining moment for me nice nice um, so you we're talking a lot about the Deschutes here. Do you have now a, a, a home river or do you consider the Deschutes your home river? Do you have something that, uh, you know, another area or do you, I mean, you fish for winter steelhead too quite a bit, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I fished all the rivers up here in Northern Oregon. I mean, when I was guiding, I did the Clackamas, the Sandy, uh, the Klickitat in Southern Washington okay. and the Deschutes. Um, I still consider the Deschutes to be kind of my, you know, my, my yep. home. Um, you know, the, the thing about the Deschutes that I, I think separates it 
from every river that I fished, and, and it's the it's really the diversity in the water. You know, if you like to fish these really long, beautiful classic runs, you got a riffle, nice long gut, big mm-hmm. tail out. You know, go tromp down one of these things for 200 yards and just get into your groove. Right, that exists. But there's also these just tons of little one person, five, ten cast spots. Some of them are so obscure, you would never think a steelhead lives there. And it takes years and years and years of just putting a fly through that water at different water levels and trying to understand it. And and then there's, you know, everything kind of in between there. So you've got, you know, I mean, you got water that that anybody could wade. I mean, I, I guided a guy one time that was 90 years old. Hmm. Nine, actually, ninety-one. Nice. And uh, and he jacked three steelhead that day, and he was just so stoked. And wow. you know, I I just fished classic little riffle water, and he had a ten foot seven weight, and you know, single yep. hand rod, and he try to get him to spay cast. And then there's you know the opposite end of the spectrum where you know I love I loved it when I would get young bucks in my boat that could weight anything because sure. I'd take them into some crazy stuff. So, um, you know, and then you you take that and add the just the sheer number of steelhead that returned to the Deschutes. I mean, the, you know, not only the Deschutes population of, of summer steelhead, which is a very cool special fish, but you get all the stray fish component that yeah. come into, you know, the lower, you know, really the, the strays are primarily from washout rapids, which is about eight miles up mm-hmm. down. They do go above that, but in mass yeah. that lower eight miles. And so I think for me, the, the thing that I loved about it the most is it became kind of a laboratory for me. I'm a, I'm a very kind of scientific, you know, minded angler, I guess. I I really try to look for patterns. And so from a fly tying standpoint, you know, you, you could tie some crazy stuff and you'd know really quickly. I mean, I'm, the Deschutes is a very bucket oriented river. So, mm-hmm. I mean, it's almost like, okay, Dave, you're in the spot, get ready. Oh, yep. And he eats it, right? Oh, yeah. So, <clears throat> you know, you can, you can really play around with different colors and different, you know, different everything i mean and, and the num the i would say the the number of weird flies that i fish now is more so than classic <laughs> flies especially in the midday game yeah uh you know in, in the low light time periods i still kind of i tend to go back to the old classics hair wings sure. you know butt skunks purple green butts that kind of stuff um but the midday stuff is is where you can really get creative not that you can't with with yeah. uh the yeah. dry line stuff i mean i i've I've got a couple of skaters that look like Legos out there that nice. <laughs> people just are like, really? And, and the fish eat them. So that's why I think that lower river is so special. You can yep. really catch a lot of different ways. And uh, there's just so much different water to fish and a lot of fish to fish too. So. Totally. So uh, you mentioned a jet sled. Uh, so if you had to, you got your uh, jet sled, your raft, or a drift boat, which one do you choose? You can only have one. <laughs> yeah. Jet sled. <laughs> it is jet sled. Okay, okay, good deal. Yeah, I mean, I mean, only because it gives me the ability to to be in the right water at the right time yeah. of the day with the right light and all of all of that stuff. I think you know, in the winter time, you know, it's it's not as critical of a piece. Um, it's just more about negotiating, you know, river traffic at that point. Um, you know, there's I still love floating rivers. I still love being in a in a drift boat, and I I do a lot of trout fishing as well. Yeah. Um, so, you know, in the spring, in the early summer, a lot of times I'm, you know, I'm, I'm cruising around upriver in my, my drift boat. But, uh, yep. you know, that the, the problem is I, I have a serious boat conundrum because I had all three at one yep. point, plus a water master. Oh, yeah. And, uh, I sold, I, when, I, when I got out of guiding, I sold my, my uh, raft, which yep. I've, I've regretted I know. because there's places I want to go. So you really almost have to have three. <laughs> yeah, it's it's true. I'm the same thing. I although the the water master or was that was that the uh, what you said there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the one. Yeah, that would be. I have. I don't have one of those. But yeah, I had a with my first kid got rid of got rid of the raft to pay for that whole thing. <laughs> and uh, yeah. so that was it. Was like drift boat or raft. I was like, oh, I'll keep the drift boat. And but uh, no, yeah. that's good. That's good stuff. Um, as far as the Deschutes River, you know, again, somebody's new to it. Um, you want to give them one resource. Is there something out there that you would direct? I'm not even sure if there's like an online resource or, you know, what, what would you tell somebody if you just said go here and get your information? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think fly shops are the are the best place to go. Yeah. Um, you know, I think the Gorge Fly Shop in Hood River um, is, is you know, kind of near the mouth. Um, you know, John, John and Amy Hazel up in Maupin, they're, they're 
on the river a ton. They're really good. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, Finn and fire and Madras, um, is, is a killer shop. And then just in the, in the Portland area, I mean, Northwest fly fishing outfitters and Royal treatment. Um, you know, those guys are super in tune. They have, you know, people out guiding that, you know, they're kind of in touch. So, you know, number one is like support your, your local shops yep, for sure. and, um, they're, they're definitely the best resource that's, that's kind of out there. Um, on, a, on a little higher note, my website, Larimer Outfitters is still up. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a ton of articles on steelhead fishing and swinging flies for trout on little two handers and bunch of this you know bunch of the stuff that i learned i wrote a lot of blog posts and stuff um yep. it's, it's somewhat dated but um we left it up just because so many people do come to that site and use it as a resource um so it's just yeah. kind of out there now even though i'm you know i'm not guiding it does have information to mm-hmm. get in touch with todd harris my business partner but uh yeah i would say though you know okay. fly shops are yeah are are definitely the best place to to really start totally yeah it's interesting it's kind of you saw a definitely a lot of shops going down over the last number of years and some big ones, um, yeah. you know, Kaufman's and things like that. But there's yeah. also, I heard, I guess there's some, uh, I heard there's another store coming up in Portland. So it sounds like yeah, there's Portland still, fly shop. Yeah. yeah. So, so that's yep, a good, that's sure. a good thing. Yeah. Um, well, it's, a cha- it's definitely a changing, uh, landscape yeah. of, you know, as people buy more and more online, I know. Um, you know, and, 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 you know, we all do it, but at the same yep. time, if we don't support those small shops, uh, they're going to end up going away and we're going to lose that resource. Exactly. So exactly. I think I heard this last, uh, was it holiday season or whatever, like a hundred billion dollars online or some, something crazy. Yeah. It was pretty insane. <laughs> the, uh, I think like s- between black Friday and, and cyber Monday, 62% of sales were through that's Amazon. That's what it was. Yeah. Totally. Uh, it's insane. Crazy. So, uh, so uh, yeah, let's see. I guess uh, we got a little bit of time here. I got uh, maybe a few questions. Maybe we'll do a, a little bit more of a rapid fire round here. Yeah. Um, so getting back to the flies, I guess you mentioned you definitely described the, the types of flies at uh, midday. But are there any, do you have any names or anything we could throw out there for flies that, that somebody could take a look at? Or are they all just kind of your own creations? Well, a lot of them, yeah, a lot of a lot of stuff in my box is not necessarily available commercially. There, there is a few. So I have a pattern called the loop leech that's through solitude flies. Um, that's that's a pretty good one. Um, Scott Howell has a, a really cool intruder pattern um, that I think fishes really well. Um, trying to think, uh, you know, Aqua Flies has done a great job. They they offer a lot of tubes and okay. stuff like that. There's not a lot of not a lot of people fishing a lot of the flash that I did. Mm-hmm. Um, so <laughs> so if you're a fly tire, you, you kind of have a little bit of an advantage there. But um, yep. you know, there are there are some patterns out there that that will work really really well. Um, but you know, I have a pattern called a, a reverse marabou that's super easy to tie. And uh-huh. and and even though that fly isn't available commercially right now, there's a lot of patterns that are fairly similar. Uh, that will work really well. Yeah, cool. Um, as far as, I mean, you already threw out a bunch of great tips and things like that, but just for steelhead in general, uh, you know, summer or winter, do you have any steelhead tips, maybe a tip or two that you'd give somebody? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think the, the biggest thing is the best anglers that I know are the best at observing the conditions around them. Mm-hmm. And a, a lot of times we go out there with sort of assumptions. People, I, I think need to really think about what are the given conditions of the day and you got to think about you know what's the water temperature what's the trend of the water temperature what's what's the you know environmental conditions the the weather what's the um you know the river traffic has it Mm. been really you know beaten down all of those things and and try to make a game plan based on the given conditions if you just go out there and do the same thing over and over again and this kind of reminds me of a funny story this Mm. guy who used to come into the shop and mop and when I worked out there, um, he was a great guy. He would only go to one of two runs, either wind knot or pipeline. And if you <laughs> fish in the mop area, you probably know those runs. Uh-huh. Uh, and they're great runs. There's no doubt about it. But this guy would get up at like three in the morning, race down there, yep. camp out for three, you know, three hours until the light came up. <laughs> one day I said, I said, Jimmy, why, why don't you fish other water? Why do you just fish those, those two runs? And he said, well, I, I only catch fish in those runs. I don't catch fish other places. Huh. So that was a great answer. Yeah. But I, I went fishing with him one night, and I realized, you know, he makes the same exact cast. He makes the exact same mend. He does everything the same. Right. And 
he doesn't ever change his presentation. Well, <clears throat> well, it just happened to work in those two runs. Um, and so being versatile and thinking about, you know, water temperature for me is like the most important thing. I'm trying to match the speed of my fly and oftentimes the depth of my fly, especially in sink tip fishing, really to what the water temperature is. And so, you know, again, the warmer it is, the more aggressive and faster you can swing it. The colder it is, the slower and usually the deeper you need to go. And mm -hmm. so just not getting caught in, in a box one way. And I think also like not being afraid to experiment. And, uh, you know, sometimes I think we, <laughs> uh, as, as anglers, it's like, you, you know, we're so scared to try something new because it might not work. Well, right. how many times did you do what was supposed to be done that didn't work? I know. And, and <laughs> so that's kind of that discovery process of, you know, just sort of figuring things, some things out. And it's amazing what you learn when when you're not stuck in a box yeah no that's a great point for sure i was just uh yeah i mean you're out there the you know fish of a thousand casts or whatever you might as well change it up and, and not do do the same cast a thousand times you know try right and, yeah you know, exactly mix up exactly. as you go um on uh, leaders what what is your typical uh leader for uh, say summer steelhead look like as far are as are we talking Dry lines or, or floating lines? Uh, yeah, just uh, sink tips. yeah. We're talking. I guess maybe you could do a quick on both. If there's yeah, a difference. yeah. So, you know, I always try to create systems, and so you see that in the fly lines that I've designed with Airflow, and I tried to create things that were like simple and easy to remember. And so, off of a Rage Compact, which is the line that I fish for for dry lines, is just sort of an aggressive Scandi taper. Mm -hmm. um, I fish a, a 10 foot intermediate poly leader and I fish an in intermediate over a floating because of two reasons. One, it's a little denser so it goes through the wind better mm -hmm. and number two, it's just a lot more durable. And on the end of that uh, poly leader, and I even fish that for dry flies, I'll just grease it with some, some fly floating mm. for fishing skaters and it works fine. Yep. Um, so on the end of that poly leader, it comes with you know, it's a polyurethane extruded leader. So there's a monofilament core that runs right. down the middle. I just, they, so you'll see when you buy it, there's about a five inch section of mono that yep. a lot of people will tie a, uh, blood a, knot or something. a infection loop into yeah. it or a, yeah, or a blood knot, either one. So what I do is I whack that off and I take a piece of 20 pound Maxima ultra green and I do a, um, an Albright knot, a mm. seven turn Albright knot. And I create about a foot long butt section with a perfection loop on it and i do that for for really two reasons one it helps with turnover mm -hmm. but two is and and you'll notice this if you fish poly leaders a lot over time what will happen is you know the the polyurethane on the outside and the nylon in the middle they stretch at different rates right mm -hmm. so if you hang up or you pull on a bunch of fish at some point that leader will start to kind of disintegrate and you'll get these little crinkles in your poly leader so if you if you put that Albright knot on it, which kind of the way that knot pulls, you'll get e even displacement of, of pressure. Oh, right. Your leaders will last you, I mean, seasons and seasons and hmm. seasons. So, and so I've got that foot long butt section added to the front of that. I'll typically use ten pound uh, Maxima Ultra Green, um, and I've got a, a great story about Ultra Green if we have time. Mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, at any rate, um, I typically do a, a, a non-slip loop knot or a, some people call it a lefties loop, saltwater loop. It's all the same thing. Um, you don't want to use a perfection loop in that junction. Um, you know, perfection loops are strong, but they don't take shock well. So in the 20 pound on the butt section, it works fine. But there you want to use that non-slip loop knot. So I go about, you know, about three feet down to the, to the fly. Sometimes I'll fish two fly rigs. Yep. But my overall kind of leader off the front of the poly leader is four feet yep so i'll have you know the 10 foot poly leader a foot butt section and about th you know three maybe four feet of uh of leader off the front mm -hmm. so on my sink tips i kind of do the same thing i bump up to 30 pound on the butt section mm -hmm. instead of 20 i do an all bright knot on on the the end of the sink tip about a foot long butt section with a perfection loop and then again you know three maybe four feet of, of 10 pound maxima um, you know, off of that. So the cool thing was, you know, when I was guiding people, I would say, look, just show up with 10 pound maxima. Yeah. And, uh, you it's know, there's times where I, I might jump down to eight if the fish are being really weird and kind of, sure. you know, not taking the fly well, usually not with sink tips. Um, and in the winter I will jump up to like 12 or even 15 pound 
for sink tip fishing. But usually in the summer, I'll fish 10 pound maxima for uh, for both. And that way, you know, be, no matter how my clients were fishing, they knew rip off, you know, three, three and a half feet, tie a loop knot on it, put it on, you're good to go, no matter yeah. whether, you're, you know, sink tip or, or or on dry line. Yeah, that's cool. No, that's awesome. That's a, a great uh, clarification there. Um, you mentioned the wind. Uh, maybe uh, quickly, can you say the Deschutes definitely is kind of 50, <laughs> 50, 50, uh, especially during the daytime, Ed. You get out there at yeah. 10 o'clock and you might be blown off. What What's your, uh, other than, you know, normal where you can actually cast, how, how do you punch through the wind? Any tips? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, first and foremost, it definitely starts with the right equipment. Um, and so, you know, the Rage was a line that um, we developed because well, a number of reasons. One was that, you know, my, my clients would get, they'd be jamming with their Skagit head during the midday. And, you know, the Skagit head has so much mass that yeah. it'll still go through the wind. Um, and then, you know, it'd come evening time, the sun's off the water, it's prime time, baby. And what was happening is the the transition going from a really light Scandi head to a Skagit head Yep. It was like, it was really hard for, you know, for the average person That's to right. kind of make that transition. And so here we are doing casting lessons in the, the middle of prime time. So <laughs> we kind of went down the road of trying to put a floating tip on a Skagit, which is just a terrible idea. I can, that's another hour long conversation okay. we won't go into now. Um, but it was sort of the band aid to the problem because what we really needed was an aggressive floating line that could go through the wind. And so, um, you know, the, the, the rage was sort of the product of that. So it was, you know, because the other problem was the Scandi heads have, they have really long tapers and really small diameters. And so what I was noticing was, you know, the head would turn over, but the leader would go way up river. And mm-hmm. then, you know, the client would try to make this big mend and, and nothing would set up the way I needed it to set up. And we just didn't catch very many fish. So, um, so the rage really came from two things. I needed a, a line that was going to help people transition from their Skagit to their floating line. Hmm. It wasn't that different. It cast fairly similar. And then number two was better turnover to punch through the wind. And um, just a really quick funny story about the Rage. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, one of the things I love about product design is when I see a product that I've developed and I see it on the water for the first time. It's yeah. just kind of a, it's kind of a cool, cool thing. Like, oh, somebody actually bought it. Awesome. Totally. Uh, so this one night I was right when the rage came out and, uh, I was coming down river and it was a hot August night and, uh, you know, it's getting dark and I see this guy, he's waited way out in uh, river, right of wagon blast. And if you've ever fished the lower dishes, you know what the waiting's like over there. And, and this guy, he's out on the big boy line. He is way out there. And as I'm getting closer, you know, keep in mind, I'm going 30 miles an hour down river. I'm getting a little closer to this guy and I can see he doesn't have a shirt on. He's got a baseball hat and he's got a pair of earphones on. Huh. And as I'm getting closer, I can see he's like, he's out there like he's really jamming, like he's almost dancing. Right? Nice. And uh, and then <laughs> as I get really close to him, I realize that the only thing he is wearing is a black speedo. No way! Oh my god! <laughs> and then and then this guy just uncorks this mega cast, and he's got the rage. And I really. Was like, Yes. Dude, that's a commercial that right guy there. Is raging. I know Tim Ray Jeff asked me if I stopped and took a picture. Yeah. Wow, that is classic. So uh so any rate, so it starts with really having the right equipment. And then, you know, I would say that, you know, number one is A, you know, just practicing your casting really helps. Yeah. But um being able to first and foremost, just shorten up. I mean that if the fly doesn't turn over, mm-hmm. and by that I mean the head extends, the leader comes tight and the fly actually lands tight your chances of catching a steelhead just went down astronomically. So you're better off literally just casting the head than casting 20 feet of shooting line and fluffing it out there. Hmm. So cast shorter in your range. Try to cast lower. I always tell people, you know, on your back cast, stop a little bit higher than you normally would. And on your forward cast, stop a little bit lower. And then I always will drop the rod tip. You know, I'll make my cast, I'll stop the rod, and I'll drop the rod tip. So everything comes tight on the forward cast. And that mm-hmm. takes a little bit of practice to be able to, uh, to kind of go through the, you know, through the wind. And then just from a, you know, a general kind of casting standpoint, I think what happens to a lot of people in the wind, especially, I mean, you've been out there, Dave, yeah. when it's blowing oh, miles yeah. an hour, it makes everybody go faster. And mm-hmm. right. what I always tell people is, you know, 
the wind is is going to help your D loop. Your D loop is like a big sail. So if normally you make, if you had a magic sensor on your hands, if there's no wind, you usually use about 40% behind you into your D loop and 60% on your forward cast. So I always tell people, look, the harder the wind blows, and this is kind of the same for casting in tight fishing hmm. uh, situations, come around with less speed in your back cast. So if mm-hmm. you normally cast 40, 60, come around 30, 70, hmm. 20, 80. So the harder the wind blows, the less the less energy you really need to kind of make in your back cast and the more energy you can make in the forecast. And that would help people. Usually when you t- tell people to slow down, it, it leads to all these bad problems. It's one of my biggest pet peeves as a casting instructor is when I hear people say, oh, you just need to slow down. Right. Uh, it's slowing down at the right time. So that would be kind of where I would start with people. And, you know, and the, there's some little other tricks that, that we do to kind of get the fly to turn over. But yeah. in general, those are those are a couple of things. Just don't don't rush your back cast. Take your time on your back cast. That is the, the beginning of making a good cast in the wind. Perfect. Perfect. Um, and did you mention you had another uh, story or was the Speedo, was that the one you wanted to get out there? Oh, no, the Speedo was a different story. Oh, okay. uh, so people ask me, you know, what tippet do you fish? And uh, a number of years ago, uh, this is, I think it may have been the first year I was guiding down there, maybe the second. Um, the, the longest clients that I've guided, uh, these two great guys, one's from uh, Seattle. Well, they were both from Seattle. One of them moved down to, uh, to California. And I just love these guys. They're, they're awesome guys. And we were fishing up in the, the clone area, which is just about eight miles up from the mouth. And, um, you know, it's kind of getting towards the end of the night. And uh, I always have these little markers. You know, as the sun goes down, I go, okay, when the sun gets to that little cliff up there, I know I've got about, you know, 30 minutes before it's dark mm-hmm. and I've got to I gotta go. <laughs> and so, you know, it's the, the light's getting up to that <clears throat> little spot. So I went down and I, I got Cal, was this guy's fishing down below and, you know, kind of, all right, man, great day. And we caught some fish that day. It was a good day. And, you know, let's head for the barn. And we're walking up. And his partner, Jim, uh, I saw him hook this steelhead. And I knew from even 100 plus yards away, actually, I was probably a little further than that, um, I could tell it was a really big fish hmm. um, just because I saw it come out of the water and went, wow, that's, it was noticeably big. Yeah. And so by the time we get up there, uh, and Jim is a very, very experienced angler. I mean, he's caught many fish with me, many fish on his own with other guides. He is freaked out. I mean, he's visually <laughs> freaked out. And all he could say is, big fish, no grab. Big fish, no grab. And I'm like, dude, <laughs> you have to like, take a breath, settle down. Right. And apparently, there was never really a grab. This just giant steelhead came rocketing out of the water, and he came tight to it in the air. Oh, wow. And, um, yeah. and I could tell by the way, just the rod was like throbbing and this was a, it was a 12 and a half foot six weight. I could tell this was a really, really big steelhead and Jim knows how to fight fish, but I'm, I'm watching this fight go down and I'm kind of coaching him now. And we're, I mean, we're putting the screws to this fish. And at one point, I mean, I'm looking up and there's no sun left on, on the, the rim of the Canyon. Right. And I'm going, I, I, I remember saying to Jim, I said, look, man, you either land this thing in the next two minutes or we have to break it off or we're going to be walking out of here tonight. Right. And, uh, and, and we finally, like, we get this thing. I, I'll never forget this, Dave. This fish came up, huh. and it looked like the side of my, like, 65-quart cooler. Huh. I mean, it's, it was massive. And I freaked out, and Jim freaked out. We both started freaking out again. Okay, settle down. And I'll just, I'll never forget when I, you know, when I put my hand around that fish's tail, around its wrist, you know, usually I uh, to shoot fish, you know, six, eight pounds. You can grab those little oh, guys yeah. pretty. Even a big fish, you know, 12, 14 pounds. This thing, I, I could not get my pinky or my forefa- or my thumb to wrap around the the actual, you know, fish itself. Huh. I mean, I just had to cradle it. Yeah. <clears throat> and um, it was massive. I mean, it, the, the head on this thing looked like a freaking Labrador retriever. Huh. Was it, it was massive. Was this in the and, uh, later in the season? <clears throat> it was in uh, October. Oh yeah, uh, kind of mid October, and um, we uh, crazy. We caught this thing on a like a size uh, eight. Yep. Re- reduced green butt skunk. I mean, exactly. it was like this. It was like the size of like a, a fourteen hairs ear, right? It was just yeah. tiny. <clears throat> and so, um, at any rate, we marked it on Jim's rod. I go, do not move your finger. We ran to the to the jet boat. I threw a ruler at him. It. We measured it out as it was just short of forty three inches. Jeez. 
I mean, it would have, I, I have no huh. doubt that it was high 20s, maybe even 30 pounds. We didn't get a girth measurement, but I mean, this thing was just, it was, no I've kidding. held some really big steelhead up in British Columbia, yep. and I, I've never seen anything even close to this thing. And so the guys still talk about that night. Sure, um, that's pretty all, sweet. On through, uh, I, I probably should have not driven the boat. <laughs> did you guys, um, uh, did you guys get a picture of it? Uh, we didn't. I mean, we were yep. literally like, I mean, it, when we came through Moody Rapids, so for those uh, that oh, yeah. list that have never been oh, on Oh, so you were, you were going, you had to go through Gordon Ridge all oh, the way down. Oh, yeah. You had to go through like four major oh, rapids wow. in a jet boat going down river. Totally. And by the time we went through Moody, it was it was dark. Um, but getting back to uh, the leader, because people say, well, you know, do you fish fluorocarbon, anything like that? So that was on eight pound maxima. Yep. But the crazy thing is there was actually a wind knot oh. in, in, in the tippet, which is like Damn. reduced almost in half. So yep. after that, I don't fish anything but maxima ultra green. I'm not even sponsored oh. by maxima, but, yeah. uh, you know, it's just, I mean, it was amazing. So it was one of the, it was the biggest steel I've ever seen and it couldn't have happened to a, you know, better couple of guys and, uh, that's and sweet. It just, you know, it, it was really cool. So. That's what it's all about. I was actually had a question here. I didn't. Uh, maybe I'll ask you next time I was going to talk about, you know, well, maybe that was it, your most memorable fish. I was thinking more for you, but, you know, that, that's pretty cool to have a most memorable one from somebody else that you guided. That's, that's a, awesome. That's, that was a good one. It's up there on, on the list of uh, list of fish for sure. That's cool. Whether it was mine or one of my clients. That's sweet. Um, good stuff. So what what do you have going in the next uh, six months or so, I guess, for yourself or for uh, G. Loomis? Anything anything new coming out? Anything we should Yeah, we for? got got some consumer shows that uh that we're doing here we're going to be in edison uh new jersey here in a couple of weeks um kind of depending on when this is published i guess mm-hmm. but uh um that's at kind of the end of january here and uh we're going to be doing some stuff at the midwest fly fishing expo in march um we don't uh we, we don't we don't really talk about new products at this point mm-hmm. but um you know we're really right. kind of i mean i pro really kind of dropped in uh, this November of last year. So it's actually still kind of on the forefront of new products for us. So, yeah. uh, we're going to be doing a lot of, uh, consumer events through our dealers. So, um, you know, especially in the Portland area, oftentimes I'm at those. So if anybody's, uh, nice. cruising around there, definitely swing by and say hi. And, uh, we'll be, uh, you know, probably doing some spay claves and stuff, uh, mm-hmm. up in here, you know, here in Portland as well as uh, there's one up in Alaska now. So yep. yeah, we just got a lot of events coming up. We'll be promoting the new rods and, uh, trying to sneak in a little fishing in the meantime. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, so I guess, yeah, did I, uh, we talked a lot about summer steelhead and things. Anything else you want to add as far as, uh, that we missed today? <laughs> we we covered uh, i think we covered the uh, my first uh, second question on uh you know midday you, you covered that well yeah yeah i mean it's a lot to talk about you know sometimes a, a good campfire and a glass of whiskey is uh yeah you, know, you can get talking about a lot of stuff but uh yeah i mean i think if there's a takeaway uh you know for the listeners is that you know respect the history respect the nostalgia of our sport and yep. it's great stuff but you know, just don't be afraid to uh, to try different things, and, and don't be afraid to fail. Because sometimes, and this is something that I always kind of preach to my clients: just because you didn't get an answer or or a response from the fish doesn't mean you didn't get an answer, right? Right. Like, you know, sometimes not catching a fish leads you down a road of figuring something out. Um, and, and it's okay. It's okay not to catch fish all, mm-hmm. all the time. So, and I know that's tough. You know, if you, if you get, I'm, I'm kind of a weekend warrior now. It's kind of funny because oh, yeah. you know, past, but now I just get to fish on my, on my weekends. But, um, you know, at the, at the same time though, man, I think, uh, you know, if everybody's swinging green butt skunks doing it the same way, yep. sometimes just doing things a little bit different, a little bit out of the box makes a huge difference. And it, you know, and it makes it fun. And I think, you know, lastly, what I'll say is that, you know, we talked a lot about kind of like positioning the fly and mm-hmm. swinging your fly. You know, I think the the thing that my clients always said to me was that, you know, they're it, it, oftentimes like they just feel like they're just hucking and hoping. And the, yeah. the, the thing for people to realize is that, you know, there's this varying degree of aggressiveness in steelhead. And it doesn't matter if it's summer or winter, but, um, you know, when they're really happy, which is like 2% of the time maybe <laughs> – they will do anything. I mean, they, you could throw a piece of dog crap on a rope out yep. there and they'll eat. Um, but the, you know, that varying degree of aggressiveness, um, 
all the little details that we kind of talked about and swinging your fly in the midday. To me, that's the difference between the guys who, you know, sometimes get them and the guys that usually get them. Yeah. And so kind of, you know, the thing that my clients always commented after they fished with me was that they actually felt like they were kind of being a part of the animal's decision making process. And so um, just stay away from that kind of huck and hope attitude. There's a lot more to it. It's it's really about swimming your fly and all those things we kind of talked about with, uh, you know, understanding the environment and the conditions that that's you have in front of you and trying to match those things and you know just uh don't don't get stuck one way of fishing yeah no it's a great great way to finish it up there uh great tom well uh where's uh do you have a good place that people can get a hold of you if they have any questions you know i i really don't now nowadays that i don't have uh <laughs> I, yeah. I don't have guide service so i don't, sure. I don't have a public uh you know public website um but i do encourage people to go check out the larimer outfitters website okay. and uh, and then oftentimes um you know todd harris my business That's partner right. uh you know he and i are are super tight we guide very similar i mean we we met each other in alaska 20 years ago and uh, you know we've learned a lot together and he has a very similar guiding style to me mm-hmm. and uh so a lot of times, you know, he'd be, a, uh, you know, a good resource to kind of get a hold of, especially uh, if somebody's looking to get out on the, on the shoots. He does the, the Sandy and Clackamas and, okay. and the North Coast as well. So um, he'd be a, a good guy to reach out to if you want to go fishing in the local area. Yeah, perfect. Great. Well, uh, yeah, I want to say thanks again for coming on and, uh, you know, sharing all this wisdom. Definitely you uh, you did a great job. I appreciate all the, the knowledge. I think a lot of people that probably, you know, both people that have fished a long time for summers and are, and are new to it are going to get a lot, of, uh, a lot of information out of this. So I appreciate that. I uh, appreciate it, Dave. It was a great time. Thanks so much for having me on. All right, you bet. We'll talk to you later. Okay, take care. Right, see you. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes, just go to wetflyswing.com and search for number 11 for episode 11. And if you like the tips of this episode, go to wetflyswing.com slash free and get the Steelhead Tips PDF Quick Guide, which includes a summary of all the uh, best tips from the episodes to date. Thanks again for stopping by to check out the show today. I'm looking forward to catching up with you soon and hopefully seeing you on the river. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com. And if you found this episode helpful, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes.